Thank you for that introduction. So I'm planning to take you on a quick tour through the topsy-turvy world of engineering materials. Going with Humpty Dumpty in Alice in Wonderland, he has this wonderful phrase, he has an argument, he's using a word and it's using, it, he's using it to mean something that isn't what it means to most other people. And he says, when I use a word, I use it to mean precisely what I use it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these words in my title. In particular, materials. I've always liked the definition, materials are the stuff that stuff is made of. They're all around you. So studying materials it isn't really limiting that much about what you could be looking at. And then engineering, I get asked whether I'm an engineer or a scientist and I hate having to choose. I have this poetic idea of science being a wilderness and engineering being the civilized part and the, the job of scientists is to go out in the wilderness and find what's useful and what, what might be valuable there and finding the beauty in both science and engineering. So I work on engineering materials. That means I don't just look at stuff, I look at stuff that might be useful. In particular, the usefulness of the materials that I look at is that they don't fall apart. The next talk will be about functional materials and those are very exciting too, but every material if you're going to use it, it would be nice if it does not fall apart. That means I'll be looking at deformation behavior of materials. Um, we'll be doing a lot of research on structure processing properties relationships and I won't be talking about that today. I will be talking a little bit about what it means to have mechanical integrity. The, I will look into toughness. And then I'll look at a material that is very dear to me, metallic glasses, which brings us back to the, the more literal meaning of the subtitle, through the looking glass. So these are four words that, that I still need to define. They're all mechanical properties. They all might colloquially be referred to as hardness. The first one is stiffness. Stiffness is about the deformation of material, how much it deforms when you apply a force to the material. Strength is about how big a force it can take before it breaks. Hardness is about two materials touching each other, and it's related to both strength and stiffness. And toughness, oops, toughness here in the right hand corner is the tricky one. That, that's about, it's also about breaking, a, a little bit like strength, but it's about flawed materials. And it comes back in a number of different contexts and you have slightly different parameters depending on how you look at it. And the really interesting thing about toughness to me is that you cannot do this with stiffness or with strength. You cannot put together two materials that are not stiff and have a compound material that is stiff. You cannot put together two materials that do not have strength and get a compound material that has a lot of strength. Hardness also. If you put together soft materials, you'll get something that is soft. But you can have two materials that by themselves are brittle and make a compound material that has a lot of toughness. And as an engineer, it's hard to do the same achievements there that happen with biological materials, but, but we're getting there. And that's one of the things that I would, would like to achieve with my research, is to provide tools and, and insight into how we can engineer toughness into materials. So here's a schematic graph of the force deformation diagram that we would measure in the lab. These four pictures here, in the beginning there is not very much deformation at all and it's perfectly uniform. But then when the force displacement curve starts to level off, the deformation is, is mostly in the narrower part of the specimen. And then 
right at the end, when the force drops off again, th then the deformation is highly localized and there's only a small part of the material that's involved in further deformation. And that's when you start to lose toughness, when only a very small part of the material is involved in the local deformation. And it's sort of remarkable that there are materials where that is not what happens immediately. Most materials you would expect as soon as there, there is a stress concentration, as soon as there is some part of the material that deforms more, that then it weakens there and that all of the, the rest of the deformation happens there too. And th that's the familiar behavior of brittle materials and the reason why metals and plastics are some of the dominant engineering materials is that in those materials the microscopic behavior is such that where the material deforms it strengthens and it strengthens more than the area decreases or it strengthens more than the increase in the localized loads when it starts to fail and that allows a graceful failure where all of the material is involved in deformation and all of the material absorbs energy and that's a simple way to get a lot of toughness out of a material. But it's also a bit of a shame if you think about where the origin of the mechanical properties comes from. Both stiffness and strength microscopically they come from the nature of the chemical bonds putting together the material. And if you want to use your material efficiently for the purpose of supporting a mechanical load and you have this strengthening mechanism still going on in the material, that means that you started with a lower strength than you could achieve with this material. That means that you're not using the material efficiently. You could spend less energy and less money to get a smaller amount of material that is stronger and can still support the same amount of load. But you need the toughness. So these extrinsic toughening mechanisms that I want to be able to study are all about how you can still have all of the material involved in the deformation, even if microscopically there isn't this strengthening mechanism. So even if you are already using the material efficiently and getting all of the strength out of the material that the chemical bonds in the material would offer you in principle. The examples that, that I work with most are metallic glasses. So the structure of most metals is crystalline. Actually, I didn't know this was going to happen, but there is a much nicer example of a lattice here on the blackboard on the other side than what I put in my presentation. It's even like a nanocrystal, not too many atoms, and then I want to come back with the chalk and draw amorphous grain boundaries in between these, um, but I won't. Maybe after. So. There are different crystalline structures. This one has six nearest neighbors, and there there are four nearest neighbors to every atom. And if you change the composition, if you make a mixture of metals, and they have different crystal structures, then you cannot just continuously go from one to the other. Also, if you raise the temperature, there tends to be more disorder in the material. So at high temperatures and arbitrary composition, the atoms are just sort of jumbled together. They're they're touching if you think of them as soft spheres. Um, th they do have well-defined distances to the next nearest atom, but they, they don't have well-defined positions. If you go still further in temperature, there will be even more disorder and you lose even the nearest distance and then you get a gas with much lower density and no mechanical properties to speak of except for pressure. But what happens when you lower the temperature of this liquid phase? And you do it at a composition where it's not so easy to form a crystalline phase. It turns out that any liquid, if you cool it down and avoid crystallization, there, there is something mysterious that happens where gradually all of the kinetics in the material slow down, everything starts happening more and more slowly, until at some point it takes forever. I, I'm not using that word lightly here. If, if you extrapolate the time needed for any transition, that time extrapolates to infinity at a finite temperature. That's the glass transition, or the ideal glass transition, because in practice you cannot wait an infinite amount of time to get the ideal glass transition. On the laboratory time scale, it already stops adjusting, it's sort of frozen in at some temperature somewhat above the glass transition. 
So it was a bit of a surprise when people discovered that even for metals that are very easy to crystallize, you still have this glass transition. But in metallic glasses, you do not have this work hardening mechanism. You do not have this strengthening mechanism that is operative in most crystalline metals. So metallic glasses have near the theoretical strength that you would predict from just the strength of the interatomic bonding in metals, and they don't have this work hardening mechanism. So, so they're a very interesting material to look at if you want to look at this fundamental aspect of the mechanics of materials. They're also interesting for other reasons in, in, if you just want to look at liquids, because like I said, there, there's this time for crystallization. And on this graph here, on the vertical axis, we have temperature. At high temperatures, there is the liquid. At low temperatures, there is the glass. And there is a supercooled liquid region in between where it takes some finite amount of time to crystallize. So you can schematically plot it like this. But with glass forming alloys, you can actually measure this experimentally. This one all the way out here on the right, the, these, these dots here show data points where people have measured how long it takes a liquid to crystallize. And those alloys have only been around for something like 20 years. For something like 50 years, people have been able to make metallic glasses by very rapid quenching using special laboratory techniques where you can achieve a million degrees per second cooling rates. But more recently, you can do something a lot simpler. If you melt some metal, you pour it into a metal mold and it solidifies there to a glass instead of to a crystal. And much more recently still, this only happened last year, people have been doing computer simulations of glass formation in pure metals. Now I don't know whether that counts as an experimental realization or not, I'm tempted to say no, but the time scales here are one, one picosecond, which it's sort of ridiculous when you think about it because in a picosecond you only get a few vibrations of the atoms and thinking of how you could possibly change the temperature on a time scale short compared to the vibrations of the atoms doesn't make much physical sense. But still, people did the simulations and it, it's neat to have the whole range of time scales there. So in the lab, what we would do, for example, well, we have this glass forming alloy that consists of zirconium, copper, aluminum and nickel in well-defined ratios and we would melt them together in, in our device and then we have sort of a, a liquid blob of a uniform composition and then we pour it into a mold and it solidifies to a glass. It's a fascinating machine um, because the, the zirconium that's the main constituent of this alloy, is highly reactive with oxygen, so you need to do this in an inert atmosphere. So we have a vacuum chamber where we can pump all the air out of this vacuum chamber and put an inert gas like argon into the chamber and then clean up the argon and then we do the rest of our processing. But then the question is, you have this vacuum chamber, how, how do you pour something in a vacuum chamber? And in most labs they have complicated setups to do this that make it hard to keep the atmosphere pure. But the people in our lab, they just tilted the whole vacuum chamber. It's, it seems simple, and it is simple, but it moves all the problems to the outside of the vacuum chamber. And those were solved. So we, we have this pretty nice system. Here you have a picture of the, the vacuum chamber tilted, so, so that's normally vertical. And then here is a picture of a copper mold with holes of different diameters that we, we, we poured the liquid into. So. So that's one way of making a metallic glass. You can also heat it back up above the glass transition and then deform it again. So, so, so that's really neat for applications that you have this fairly narrow temperature range and below this temperature you have a high strength metallic solid that you can use for practical applications because it's got this high strength if you can somehow make the design where the, the toughness is already good enough. That, but then if you raise the temperature a little bit above that, suddenly it's a liquid and you can deform it and you can give it any shape you like and you can make very small details in, in these materials. So, so they're very interesting for micro mechanical devices and mass production of that sort of thing.
And we're actually looking at various applications. Um, most of these are from other labs around the world working on this sort of thing. This one's sort of neat where they reproduce the micrometer scale features of a hologram in the mold and then press that mold into the metallic glass and the metallic glass comes out with the hologram. Um, so here's a more scientific plot perhaps of the mechanics of zirconium based glass forming alloys. You can see that it just has this elastic region and then it's perfectly plastic. Microscopically these things are perfectly plastic. And on the fracture surface you can see that they actually melted again. So microscopically this material has all the toughness you could like. It absorbs enough energy to raise the temperature of the material above the melting point of the material. You cannot have more toughness than that. But macroscopically, because it localizes, Macroscopically, it's as if this material were brittle. So, how do you deal with this? You have to be able to, to modify it, you have to be able to measure it. And when I went back to Brussels, I found this technique, an image-based measurement that I thought would be great for measuring these localized deformations. You can buy commercial techniques for something called digital image correlation that gives you these sorts of plots um, with, you get a color map of where there is more deformation. You, you can track all the points in the image. So here is an example of my own work where you can see that this is the top right corner of, of the previous sample there. And you can see that this yellow rectangle has moved through the image. And when you warp those distorted rectangles back to a square shape, it's always the same shape. So that's the principle of the technique that by doing this warping, you would get back to the right, to the same initial image all the time. And if you have that displacement field that turns the original image into the observed image, then you assume that that is the actual deformation field of the material. And you can do this with very, very high accuracy because if you have a black and white edge going over a pixel and you get grayscale from the pixels, then the partial coverage of that pixel, pixel gives you a sub-pixel displacement quantity. And so we have developed specially optimized patterns where there are just a lot of black and white edges going th all through the image in every possible direction so that almost every pixel of this image in a deformed image will give you information about the displacement field and we're developing mathematical techniques that can also deal with highly localized deformations in this sort of technique that the commercial software does not work with. Here's an example of how with different sizes of the interrogation region you can get the same quality results for basically a camera with half as many pixels uh, as you would otherwise get uh, and since then the patterns have improved. So if you've bought a digital camera then you'll know that having more pixels is more expensive and having more data from a cheaper camera or more data, a lot more data from the same camera is actually economically worthwhile. I'd like to leave with the thought that if you do the same sort of diffraction experiment on this pattern that you would do with x-rays on a metallic glass, it actually looks quite similar. So that brings us back full circle to image-based measurements and bulk metallic glasses as engineering materials.